Welcome back to Sonic Unleashed Cross Platform. Last time we talked story, visuals, sound, the werehog, the tornado, and the shitty mobile game. Now we're back to discuss the day stages, S rank, side content, and the ending. Before I dig into the Sonic half of this game, I want to clarify something. When I announced this video in a community post, I got loads of replies telling me that Unleashed, presumably the 7th gen version, was one of, if not that person's favorite Sonic game, and that they were looking forward to this review. I'm sure that most of that was just my subscribers looking forward to a new review from a creator they like. However, I kind of got the implication that people expected I would like Sonic Unleashed as much as they do, and were looking forward to me defending it like I did the Millennium Games. Maybe I'm barking up the wrong tree entirely, but I, I kind of got that vibe. And yeah, I've already defended many aspects of Sonic Unleashed, including the Werehog. There is a part of me that genuinely understands why either version of Sonic Unleashed would be someone's favorite Sonic game. The globetrotting art direction, the varied soundtrack, the charming hubs, and even the story is well animated and well acted despite just being Sonic Adventure again. There's plenty to love in both of these games for sure. In fact, I would actually agree that the Wii version of Sonic Unleashed is an underrated installment of the series that might become one of my personal favorites on repeat playthroughs. All that said, my opinions on the 7th gen Sonic Unleashed Unleashed haven't really changed that much. That's not to say that I hate this game, or that I would rank it lower than the mid-aughts games, or even Black Knight. Among all the problems Dark Age Sonic games have, the biggest is that they were consistently boring, and boring is the last word I'd use to describe Sonic Unleashed. More accurately, I'd say my opinion of 7th Gen Unleashed is split right down the middle. On one hand, I genuinely enjoy the night stages as a fan of spectacle fighters. On the other hand, while the day stages have their share of awesome moments and can be fun under very specific circumstances, on the whole I find them frustrating and poorly designed, especially the optional stages. And this drags down my overall enjoyment of the game to the point where I would never choose to replay it over most other main series Sonic games. While that may trigger some of you, my job as a critic is not to reaffirm what my audience already thinks of a game. Whether whether I'm defending Mega Man and base, or criticizing Sonic 2, my raison d'etre has always been to encourage people to think for themselves and not to take common wisdom for granted. If you disagree with me and consider Sonic Unleashed an amazing game that's just not for me, that's fine. Great even. If you feel your opinion on either of these games hasn't been properly represented, don't wait for someone else to make that video. You have the right to make your own videos and speak your piece just as much as as I do. At the end of the day, I'm not out to change your mind because we both know that's never gonna happen. What I do hope is that you'll hear me out and understand where I'm coming from. Okay? Okay. Before we get ahead of ourselves, let's subject the day gameplay to our four-pronged test to see whether it matches up with the appeal of the franchise. As you'd expect, both console versions of Unleashed pass with flying colors. Right off the bat, we've got springs, robots, loop-de-loops, and all the other set dressing you'd expect from a Sonic game. The goal is simply to get to the end of the stage with no strings attached. While there isn't nearly as much pure platforming in either game as in the classic or Dreamcast era titles, there's enough of it here to satisfy that part of the test. Finally, Sonic Unleashed promises a speedy thrill ride through stages inspired by real-world locations. The day gameplay in Sonic Unleashed looks and feels like Sonic in a way that the Werehog simply doesn't. In terms of the actual playstyle, both versions of Unleashed more or less adapt Sonic Rush for 3D, namely the Sonic Boost mechanic which runs on a meter filled up by grabbing rings, defeating enemies, and doing tricks. Many set pieces like Rainbow Rings, Boosters, Trick ramps and wall poles also return from previous games. Sonic in this game plays more like a car, with drifts, acceleration, braking, lane changing, etc. The concept behind the boost gameplay in Sonic Unleashed was an interesting one, and a brilliant way to soft reboot the 3D series after Sonic 06 turned the adventure formula into a laughing stock. While later games would be fine this playstyle, 7th Gen Unleashed is unfortunately a textbook example of first game syndrome. It's important to acknowledge that virtually 
every game in the series, including the beloved classics, suffer from what I call the Sega learning curve. The likes of Shaymay or my pal Nick on Planet Ripple have argued that whereas Nintendo tends to emphasize accessibility and consistency in both design and mechanics to appeal to a wider audience, Sega generally employs a loosey-goosey, arcadey design philosophy to encourage players to keep coming back, learn special tricks, and perfect their playstyle. What this often means, however, is that the controls are more difficult to master and the games come off as really messy on a first playthrough. Obviously, not every Sonic game will be for everyone, and different people will naturally want different things. However, I think the Sega learning curve is a big part of why newcomers have such a hard time getting into this franchise, regardless of where they start. These games require the player to tolerate some jank design and quirky controls not found anywhere else, and not everyone has the interest or drive to push past that barrier. Those that do will discover games with tons of depth and nigh endless replayability. And this isn't a phenomenon exclusive to Sega games either. I'd say that Mega Man and Base and Super Mario Sunshine fall into this category for me, being messily designed games that really open up on subsequent playthroughs. The Sega learning curve is the reason I didn't like the classics the first time I played them in 2004. As someone used to the adventure formula in 2D Mario, the physics-based 2D gameplay was very different from anything I'd played before, and the clunky difficulty design and limited continues put my younger self off from finishing them for years. In 2015, I posted a now dated review of Sonic the Hedgehog 2, where I criticized the poorly optimized camera, awful enemy placement, harrowing continue system, and memorization-based special stages, and articulated how these made my first playthroughs of the Genesis version in 2011 one of the most frustrating experiences I've ever had with a Sonic game. Sonic 2 is a prime example of the Sega learning curve at work. Seeing as my first playthroughs really pissed me off while I can effortlessly beat this game without dying in 2019. It wasn't until I essentially forced myself to learn the controls and actually finish these games a few times that I began to understand the arcade genius hidden behind the learning curve and began to really appreciate Sonic 1 especially. And I'm not the only one who had this experience. I feel like uh, you kind of develop muscle memory and intuition for certain games and their flaws when you get more experience with them, you know? Yeah. Like you kind of accustomed to the weird quirks of a game and, and its mechanics and its controls. Yeah. And then when people don't have that experience, like for us, it's like, wow, this game is so easy. Wow, you suck. Look at how bad you're playing. But that's just simply because we have all the experience and we know the ins and outs of how it plays and how to avoid all the bullshit. Yeah, it can yeah. be really, really hard to with a game, especially with a game that you've been playing like most of your life or something to even remember, yeah. to even see like some of the things that other people might struggle with as problems. Uh, I remember particularly noticing that with myself when uh, when Sonic Mania came out. And you know, you had people like making these, <clears throat> making like having problems with it that I remember vaguely having like 25 years ago, but it's really hard to sort of, yeah. Yeah. it can be really hard to remember that sort of mindset. I remember when I first started playing Sonic games, like the classic Sonic games, I didn't know you were supposed to roll down slopes and manipulate you know, the environment that way. So I had the hardest time making it past the first few levels of any given Sonic game. And then I got the Mega Collection and one day as I was playing uh, one of them, it just clicked. I suddenly realized, oh, hey, I can use the physics, I can use momentum to get where I want. And suddenly, the games were super easy and I blew through them all in just a couple of days. But you see, before I realized that, when I was playing it as a more conventional game, I had the hardest time with it. And I understand that that's how most Sonic games play, really. That's how most Sega games play, because they have a much more arcadey mindset, where the goal isn't just to simply make it to the end, but to look good, to look stylish while you, while you do it. And that's not for everybody. The Sega learning curve is also why I love pulling off tricks, racking up combos, and cleverly using hints in Sonic Adventure 2, consistently finishing every stage in roughly five minutes, while some newcomers take over an hour to finish Mad Space and hate every minute of it. More to the point, the Sega learning curve is the reason why people are now joining the conversation to express their love for Sonic Unleashed, a game that was critically panned upon release and which was soon forgotten about when the more accessible 
multiple colors and generations came along. Needless to say, replaying the 7th gen Sonic Unleashed and conquering its Sega learning curve for the first time really put my enjoyment of games like Sonic Adventure 2 and Sonic Heroes into perspective. Bear in mind folks that I didn't pull an IGN and criticize this game without finishing it, allegedly. Between all the versions, I put in a good 100 hours of recording time for this review. Roughly half of that was spent on the 360 version alone. I went from being a noob who remembered little of this game's level design or control quirks to S-ranking every stage in the game, maxing out all my stats, and collecting all 400 medals. I experienced both ends of the Sega learning curve for this review, and I now understand why someone would dislike Sonic Adventure 2 in a way I really didn't before. Fact is, I was 10 when I first played it, and I don't really remember what it was like to play Mad Space for the first time, and the only real way to know is to go back in time and ask my younger self. I'm not saying that the Sega learning curve excuses bad design choices in the classics or the 3D games. I'm just saying it helps us to understand part of why this series is so polarizing. Nevertheless, I still consider the 7th Gen Unleashed to be one of the weakest games in the main series, and this is because not all Sega learning curves are experienced equally. While I can thoroughly enjoy recent playthroughs of Sonic 1, despite its flaws, Sonic 2's trial and error special stages and bad camera continue to actively frustrate me on subsequent playthroughs even though I rarely die anymore. No matter how many times I play this game, I still find it annoying. And even after sinking 50 hours into the 360 version for this review, I feel the same way about Sonic Unleashed stay gameplay. In fact, there are a lot of parallels between Sonic 2 and Sonic Unleashed that I didn't realize until I wrote this script. So let's go ahead and dissect the pros and many cons. Before I get into the negatives, I want to acknowledge the things I liked. The Sonic community in the past few years has seemingly decided that Sonic stages have to be giant mazes with a million different pathways to be good. You can lecture me all day long about how amazing and intricate Sonic Mania is, but to me, these stages are confusing mazes that lack flow and direction, and while it's impossible to get lost per se, I always feel like these stages are pulling me in a billion different directions at once and I hate it. I will always prefer the simplicity of a marble zone, a sky rail, or a starlight carnival. And that's why Sonic 1, Adventure 2, and Colors are my favorite games in the series. With that rant out of the way, I appreciate that both versions of Sonic Unleashed keep the level design straightforward and simple. The way forward is unambiguous, and while there are alternate pathways, stages never become confusing or maze-like. Like the Werehog stages, the developers also knew to change things up once in a while. Levels are built in discrete sections that test different parts of Sonic's moveset, whether that be quick-stepping lasers from arrow chasers or the interceptor, jumping through some platforms, dodging obstacles on rails, etc. For what it's worth, this game absolutely nails the spectacle of running through different parts of the world at breakneck speed. Overall, though, I consider the Wii stages better than their 7th gen equivalents for several reasons. The level design reason being that the alternate pathways are clear to spot and challenging to get into, while very clearly tightening up your run of the stage for the S rank. The philosophy behind alternate routes, as I understand it, is two-pronged. One, to increase replayability by offering paths with substantially different gameplay. Two, to encourage the players to string together the fastest routes to complete the stage as quickly as possible. The alternate routes in the 7th gen stages, with the exception of the hidden shortcuts in Shamar, lack substantially different gameplay and don't really seem to tighten up your run that much, and only serve to make stages feel more complicated than they really are. While browsing through footage to edit this review, I did notice more actual shortcuts than I remembered, so credit where it's due and all that. Nevertheless, I still maintain that while the Wii paths also lack substantially different gameplay, the 6th gen version still has the tighter mastery on the speedrunning prong of multiple paths. The beginning of Jungle Joyride provides a good basis for comparison. You have so many options as to how you want to navigate the stilt village, but ultimately none of these options really feel faster than the others, nor do they contain unique gameplay. Compare this to the Wii Jungle Joyride, where right from the start you can choose from taking a more difficult path on the left that's faster, or an easier path on the right that's slower. In Shamar Day, you can choose between trying to run up a sandfall to get to the faster route, or taking the slower, easier route. Every day stage in Wii Unleashed is built on this kind of design, and rewards players for pulling off more difficult gameplay, and it helps me understand much more why someone would like multiple paths in a Sonic game. 
With all that said, it's time to talk about the control. Sonic is unfortunately no stranger to unorthodox controls. Unleashed differs from most previous games in that there were always ways to work around the most offensive control issues. Locking on while hovering, throwing fireballs instead of punching on the ground, increasing traction with flying in power formations, and even Sonic Forces just got more comfortable for me the longer I played it. While Unleashed's controls are absolutely playable, there are persistent issues that never subsided no matter how long I played it. Starting with movement, Sonic's overall handling just feels wrong. While in hubs, he moves too slowly and turns too sharply. Everywhere else, the handling in this game is so slippery that it makes Heroes and Shadow feel like the adventure games. Sonic just sort of slides all over the place while running and is generally too fast to the point where I have to slowly tiptoe around entrance stages to avoid slipping off of platforms. The stomp and the skid are completely worthless for slowing down, say if you missed a medal or something and need to backtrack. So turning around while running is basically impossible unless you come to a complete pace-breaking halt. The platforming control in this game is stiff and awkward, like you have to press the jump button a half second earlier than you normally would, or you'll run off a cliff and die. Sonic's jump arc feels too short, and it's impossible to correct a jump in mid-air, and this makes the few moments of actual platforming really clunky and awkward. Colors, Lost World, and Forces added a double jump for a reason, because it helps you correct jumps and reach those tricky platforms a lot easier. Sonic Unleashed could have really used that. Some might argue that Colors has too much 2D, and Unleashed is better because it has more 3D in it. First of all, it really doesn't. Sonic Unleashed indeed has fully 3D hub worlds and entrance stages, and the Werehog stages are 100% free roaming 3D. And yes, Colors is indeed a side-scroller with some 3D in it and not the other way around. I won't disagree on that much. However, in terms of the actual Sonic stages in Sonic Unleashed, 90% of them is spent in 2D side-scrolling sections or running down linear corridors, which are basically side-scrolling sections with a different camera angle. You know, kind of like Crash Bandicoot. Unleashed stay stages just have more hallways than Colors does, which gives the false impression it has more 3D when it's really just as restrictive. Second of all, the times Unleashed does expect you to maneuver around and jump in free roaming 3D are the absolute worst parts of this game. And no, I'm not talking about the Werehog, folks. Something that would feel effortless in the adventure games feels awkward and unnatural due to Sonic's handling and jump physics. So yes, colors may be lacking both in 3D hubs and 2D hallways, but at the end of the day, actual 3D platforming isn't the boost formula strength and never will be. I'd rather these boost games focus on what they do well, namely spectacle and 2D platforming, rather than trying to shoehorn in 3D elements that feel bad to play. Unfortunately, the handling is only the tip of the iceberg. Unleashed introduces the quick step as a way to dodge obstacles while running straight ahead, something that would have been really useful in 06's mock speed sections. Furthermore, the left analog stick is locked to a strafe while boosting, which was smart. While the quick step was a good addition, even it has some finicky aspects. For one thing, quick steps only seem to work in straight hallways. So if you're in a big open area, it's not going to help you that much. Secondly, even in hallways, the quick step only seems to lock onto three splines going through a hallway. So if you're not entirely on top of a spline, you'll lock onto the nearest one instead of dodging the obstacle like you want. This won't get you killed, but it does make holding onto rings for the S rank more annoying than it needs to be. And after a while, I found myself just using the analog stick because it was simply more reliable. The homing attack debuted in Sonic Adventure and allows Sonic to lock onto and bash the nearest enemy by tapping the jump button midair. If there wasn't an enemy nearby, Sonic would do an air dash to cross gaps. Bafflingly, the Unleashed designers thought it would be a fantastic idea to map the homing attack and the air dash to the boost button, which also triggers the air boost once you've unlocked it. While this game does thankfully carry over the lock-on symbol from Secret Rings, I can't tell you how many times the homing attack itself failed or the air boost sent me flying off a platform at light speed. It also means that if you have any boost whatsoever, you can't use the air dash. You'll air boost instead of air dashing, which makes precision platforming even more awkward than it already was. Speaking of the air dash, upgrades are back for some reason, even though nobody ever liked them. I love the extra mobility 
quality, don't get me wrong, I just don't like having to unlock them every time I replay the game. Even when I replay Adventure 2, I use a cheat code so I can just have them all from the get-go. That means useful abilities like the stomp, the wall jump, and the light speed dash, which are critical for accessing alternate paths and tightening up runs for the S rank, aren't fully accessible until Shamar. Why? Thankfully, the Wii devs had the sense to just give you all your moves from the beginning, though they also felt the need to overly tutorialize them in Secret Ring-style training missions. The Lightspeed Dash also debuted in Adventure and has always been a finicky mechanic that required some strict timing. And despite Sonic Unleashed, Finally, not mapping the light speed dash to the ground pound button, somehow in terms of responsiveness, this mechanic is worse than ever. You basically have to mash the Y button over and over or it won't activate. The boost works pretty much as you'd expect, but it also triggers an awful post-processing effect that smears an already blurry game into jelly and makes it difficult to see where you're going. Seriously, let's just pause this for a moment. Look at this. Yeah, it makes you feel faster than Generations, which removed this effect, but it comes at the cost of visual fidelity, performance, and visibility. It's because of stuff like this, the bad frame rate, and the often muddy textures that I just can't agree that this is the best looking game in the series. I'm sorry, but this game just has not aged well visually. There are a handful of sections in Unleashed where Sonic will run on water, which sounds cool, until you realize he'll instantly drown if he stops boosting, and that he can barely move. Your only hope for dodging obstacles on the water is the drift, which is the most useless ability in this game. I cannot stress enough that this mechanic simply doesn't work. It is absolutely worthless. Sonic's drift arc alternates between being too sharp and too wide, making it impossible to feel out when you should start drifting or where to drift from. Decisions you have to make while running at light speed. This mechanic is simply too janky to allow any precision of movement on land, let alone on water. Also, I've got to take a moment to mention the camera. Visibility has always been a problem in Sonic from day one, but at least the Genesis games had the excuse of being 320 by 224 and sprite based. They still should have panned the camera like most other side scrollers, but short of making the sprite smaller, there wasn't much else they could do. 7th Gen Unleashed, meanwhile, is a fully 3D game that zooms the 2D camera in as closely as possible when it really doesn't need to. Compare the average camera angle from this game to the Wii version, which is much more dynamic and tilts to the side slightly so you can see what's ahead. Sonic Colors pulls the camera back even more, completely eliminating camera-based bullshit. While the 7th gen camera never got me killed or anything, not in the main stages anyway, it still feels claustrophobic and makes it really difficult to get into shortcuts or alternate routes unless you've already memorized the stage layout. Looking through the footage, I did find more moments than I remembered where the camera tilts or zooms properly. Nevertheless, compared to the Wii version, there are still plenty of times where the game just doesn't give you enough time to react to dash rings and the like. On that note, every single one of these stages feels clunky and awkward on their first playthrough. Partially because of the camera, partially because of the controls, but mostly because the levels weren't designed well around the things. Stages just feel like a bunch of stuff flying on screen and passing you by before your brain has a chance to evaluate what it just saw, and I found that really frustrating. Bear in mind that I played this on a low latency computer monitor. I don't even want to know what this game plays like on a leggy TV screen. The controls and camera aren't unplayable by any means, but nevertheless feel bad to play. And I suspect the designers knew that, which is why 90% of this game is spent in hallways where you'll mostly be boosting in a straight line are 2D side-scrolling sections where the awful turning, dysfunctional drifting, suicidal air boost, and terrible 3D movement never come into play. And to Unleashed's credit, as long as you do what the game expects you to do, the controls maintain an illusion of functionality. Well, in the main acts anyway. I'll even go as far to say that as long as you play Unleashed casually and just focus on reaching the final boss, it's easy to ignore most of these issues. As bad as the drift is, it's never required to finish the game. However, the moment you go off the beaten path to look for medals, which are required to progress or, god forbid, try to S-rank these stages, you'll quickly realize that this game is held together with staples and hot glue.
Meanwhile, the Wii controls are better than the 7th gen controls, but still have their share of quibbles. Like the 7th gen version, moving around in open environments isn't that great. But here the problem is the opposite with Sonic feeling too stiff, which is my preferred poison of the two. Thankfully, the day stages omit open 3D sections altogether, so you never have to jump around on prayer wheels or anything the controls weren't designed for. All the free roaming 3D platforming is relegated to low stakes puzzle rooms and the guy gate where you can take your time and play in your jumps. The wall jump is different from other games in that you have to hold the control stick in the direction of the wall to jump off of it, but that's relatively easy to get used to. The DualShock and Classic controller layout is also different from the 7th gen boost games, while the GameCube and Nunchuck schemes are different from Sonic Colors. So if you're used to these other games, it might take you a bit to reprogram your muscle memory. That's not really this game's fault as much as it is the 7th gen control scheme carrying over to future games. The analog sensitivity on the PS2 also feels off, like they copy-pasted the code from the Wii controls instead of optimizing for the DualShock Superior analog stick. This landed me in trouble my first couple stages, but after that I adjusted to it. The biggest problem is that Sonic simply takes too long to turn around in 2D, even longer than he does in the 360. Most of the stages are spent moving in a straight line, but it can be kind of annoying in the ring missions. So yes, the 6th gen controls indeed have their own learning curve and have their moments where they don't perform as expected. Regardless, they still showcase a score of improvements over their 7th gen cousin. And whereas the 7th gen controls still don't feel right to me after 60 odd hours of playtime, the 6th gen controls consistently work well for me after mastering this game's Sega learning curve. I've already mentioned the superior camera and having your abilities from the get-go, but I've got to take a moment to mention the drift. It's no generation's drift, but compared to the 360 PS3 version, it might as well be. Drifting consistently functions in a way that the player can predict, which makes it fun to drift around corners. If I had these controls for Savannah Citadel Act 2, then that level wouldn't suck nearly as much. I also much prefer how boosts are relegated to a handful of uses that recharge as you collect rings and defeat enemies, which 360 PS3 fans tend to criticize. This was obviously done because the boost is mapped to shaking the remote and you can't exactly hold that down, and I can see why this would be an adjustment if you're used to generations. However, this boost system has the side effect of making the player choose the most optimal moments to boost rather than spamming it through the whole stage like the 7th gen version. Yes, the Wii PS2 version is slower, but that's a good thing. It's much easier to see what's coming and prepare for it, and it also means you don't have to be boosting constantly to make the S rank. In fact, let's talk about how speed is used in Unleashed. Sonic was born as a marriage of platforming and speed physics based gameplay. However, these two elements contradict the other. It's hard to platform when you're going fast, and it's hard to go fast when you're platforming. More importantly, too much speed decreases the player's ability to react to incoming hazards and makes the game difficult to control in general. The only time Sonic Team really nailed a perfect balance, in my opinion, was Sonic and Shadow in Adventure 1 and 2. Sonic has flawless 3D platforming control. The camera is always facing relevant hazards, but he still feels plenty speedy. Unfortunately, every other game in the series fails to achieve this perfect balance for one reason or another. Despite what some people would have you believe with the release of Mania, even the precious classics struggle with this issue. Camera panning, movement speed, and enemy placement have been a problem in 2D Sonic from day one. The only way to really avoid hazards with such limited visibility is to slowly tiptoe around stages, and at that point, the game isn't exactly fast anymore. Sonic 3K avoided this problem by segregating platforming and speed into separate sections of the stage. And while it works mechanically, it just goes to show that speed and platforming don't really mix that well when you stop and think about it. Thus, most Sonic games tend to prioritize one over the other. Sonic 1 and Sonic Colors, while not slow by any means, emphasize platforming far more. Others may disagree, but personally, I prefer Sonic games that go all in on platforming and downplay speed over one that tries to balance the two and fails. Because frankly, the former is just more fun to control. Sonic 2 and Sonic Unleashed, meanwhile, are what happens when Sonic designers emphasize speed over and above 
every other element at play. Sonic 2, as a sequel, set out to do more with speed than its predecessor, removing the speed cap and platforming-focused level design from the first game. Unfortunately, this made the game more difficult to control, and this is why I find the game so annoying even on repeat playthroughs. But you know what? Even as a speed-focused game, Sonic 2 still had plenty of platforming for me to sink my teeth into. I can still get some fun out of this game. No, if there's any one game that goes all in on speed and neglects platforming, it's Sonic Unleashed. This game wants you to blaze along faster than any Sonic game before or since, but the speed comes at the cost of control, not just in terms of how well it's programmed, but in terms of what the designers can expect from the player. Consequently, Sonic Unleashed's main stages have far and away the least amount of platforming in the entire main series. When there is platforming, it's often pretty basic and done in side-scrolling 2D. The optional acts are a different, much more aggravating story, but we'll get to those. This lack of platforming applies to both the 6th and 7th gen versions of Sonic Unleashed. However, the Wii Boost system allows for better visibility and tighter control, while incentivizing players to use their boosts carefully. The 360 PS3 version, meanwhile, just amounts to holding down the X button for the whole stage, and even mandates this for the S ranks, and that's the core from which all the other problems stem. I've seen people argue that the Wii stages are mostly empty hallways, which is somewhat true, but not entirely fair. It is nevertheless a pretty accurate descriptor for Windmill Isle, but as you go along you'll fight more enemies and dodge more hazards, and the best paths become more difficult to enter. There's plenty of substance to these stages, well, at least as much as the 7th gen stages anyway. There's still not a lot of platforming to be had, even less than the 7th gen version actually, and if you don't go for the S ranks, you might not appreciate how cleverly designed they are. I've also seen people argue that while the 7th gen stages are clunkier, they also have more to master and are thus more replayable. I kind of understand this argument. After all, it's my reasoning for preferring Sonic Adventure 2 over the more accessible SA1. Because that game is so simple that there's nothing to keep you coming back besides spin dash jumping. Whereas SA2 was harder to get into but makes up for that with its sheer depth of mastery. However, in the case of 7th Gen Unleashed, I'd argue that mastering these stages is more a matter of memorization and luck than it is about building up a skill set like Adventure 2. In that sense, I'd argue the Wii stages reward skillful playing more, vis-a-vis -vis the faster pathways. But wait, the hypothetical audience member says, why are you complaining about the original controls when you could just play the Unleashed project instead? In case you didn't know, this was a Sonic Generations mod released in 2013 and created by the talented modders at Team Unleashed, which allows you to play the Unleashed Day stages in Generations PC in up to 4K 60fps. Some would herald this as a fixed version of Unleashed, seeing as it removes the wear Hog, Dark Gaia, and Eggman land from the game. One thing I should mention is that this mod will crash upon loading the White World if you own a 20 series Nvidia GPU like me. So I had to remove the custom White World from the mod in order to play all the stages. Even then, I encountered my fair share of random crashes. The issues are on Nvidia's end to fix, so there's not much Team Unleashed can do about it. Regardless, Project Unleashed is indeed an improvement over Base Unleashed in many respects, not least of which is 4K 60fps support. The increased frame rate especially does wonders for these stages and gives the player more time to react to hazards. Additionally, if you ever needed proof that Sonic Team cleaned up the controls for generations, this is it. Right from the beginning, I felt a significant difference, and it greatly increased my enjoyment of these stages. On top of that, the devs added five red star rings and new locations in each stage, and a texture artist even drew up higher res versions to replace the blurry originals. Clearly, a lot of passion and love went into making this mod, and I have nothing but respect for the hardworking folks at Team Unleashed. Unfortunately, the Unleashed project is hardly a substitute for an actual PC release of Sonic Unleashed, even by the developer's own admission, not least because it's missing my preferred half of the game, but also because a lot of things just didn't translate to generations. Some of the enemies, like the Fire Polyworlds or the Interceptor, are missing, so the team had to substitute them with assets already in generations. In the case of Empire City, they replaced the Interceptor chase with dodging cars, and I actually prefer this to the original. Trick ramps had to be replaced with rainbow rings above regular ramps, and if you're used to the original stages, you'll never know to jump in time. On that note, all the level design problems from the original carry over here, slamming into 
objects you can't see coming, secret passageways exiting the frame before you know it, the camera being zoomed in way too close, etc. I imagine this was because Team Unleashed had no real way to change it with the current modding tech, but it goes to show that these were level design problems that even tightening the controls or increasing the frame rate can't fix. On top of that, I ran into some annoying glitches, like sonic air boosting at the end of skydiving sections. I definitely recommend the Unleashed project to anyone who hasn't played it already, but it hardly exonerates the day stages as a whole. At most, it's a showcase for how good an actual PC release of Unleashed could be with mods to improve on what doesn't work. Speaking of which, the 360 version is backwards compatible on the Xbox One, but while Generations 360 was enhanced to native 4K on Xbox One X, Unleashed on Xbox One X received no One X enhancements whatsoever and is merely an emulation of the 360 version, anamorphic 720p and all. It does receive the usual one emulation advantages like V-Sync, and for what it's worth, the frame rate seemed a little more consistent in what I played, but it's still a disappointment that Sega didn't bother to enhance the game for One X. That said, it's time to talk about the ranking system, which is so central as to how New Millennium Sonic games are designed. As stated before, the 7th gen day stages in my first play just felt like a bunch of stuff flying on screen before the player could react, due to the poor camera, bad controls, and overemphasis on speed. But any Sonic fan worth their salt knows you're not meant to play these stages exactly once. From the beginning, the series has always been about last ability through replayability. It's a huge part of the Sega learning curve. One of my problems with the classics is that exploring pathways and replaying the game isn't really incentivized well outside of intrinsic satisfaction. The lack of a post-credits clear time especially is a boggling omission for such a speedrun-centric game. You can tell me all day about how much fun it is to spin dash jump in Adventure 1, and it is, but I never really felt compelled to replay these stages for the lols because there were never leaderboards or anything to work towards. Well, to be fair, there are the time trial missions, which I really should get around to completing someday, but for whatever reason, I never felt compelled to do so. This is why Adventure 2 introducing the ranking system is so critically important. This is the game's way of rewarding you for learning the playstyle and the level design, of incentivizing you to overcome the Sega learning curve and master the game. And it's impossible to overemphasize how central this was to everything about SA2's level design. Essentially, the game asks you to reach the end of the stage quickly without dying, all the while collecting points through playing well. While I do really enjoy A-ranking SA2 to this day, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that all the missions were great, because they weren't. While most of the missions in this game are fun, or at worst tolerable to A-rank, you do have the rocket in Metal Harbor, or the god-awful 100 ring mission in Mission Street, and finishing Final Rush without dying could be really frustrating. A-ranking Sonic Heroes I thought was overall better, but some of the Chaotix missions were pretty bad. Now, I've only fully S-ranked the four games shown on screen, so this is subject to change. As of right now, however, I think the 6th gen Sonic Unleashed has the best S-rank experience in the entire series, while the 7th gen Unleashed has by far the worst. I already covered the Werehog stages and how you have to spam QTEs to earn your S, or how a simple mistake in Tornado Defense earns you a date with loading screens and an unskippable cutscene. While S-rank requirements for the bosses can be a bit picky, it should only take you a few tries to beat. There are even a few easy to S-rank day stages like Skyscraper Scamper Act 2 or Dragon Road Act 3. In terms of most day stages, however, you can tell something is very wrong right from Windmill Isle Act 1 when no matter how fast you beat the stage or how many rings you collect, the best you can seem to do is an A. Any sane person would have given up here and just played the game casually. But unfortunately for the both of us, I'm not sane. For some reason, I just couldn't resist being able to say I got all the S ranks in Sonic Unleashed and thus persevered. I do want to preface this conversation in saying that S ranks are indeed a self-imposed challenge. So I do share some of the blame with the designers for what I went through. Additionally, much like Sonic 2 and its terrible special stage system, 7th Gen Unleashed is indeed a vastly more enjoyable experience when played casually. All of this 
this is true. If you're content to just casually play the main campaign and that's good enough for you, that's perfectly legitimate. Nevertheless, I'm a completionist. And once you've flipped that switch in your brain, it's really difficult to make yourself play games casually. More importantly, as a reviewer, I pride myself on a holistic assessment of a game's single player content. And that means optional content is fair game. Also, just because something is optional does not excuse it from criticism. If the side content is flawed, I reserve the right to criticize the game and rate it lower because of it. End of story. I also can't stress enough that this is Unleashed's key incentive to master the stages in its biggest source of replayability. If it's so frustrating that the average player gives up on it right away, that's bad. Well, at least the S ranks aren't so easy that you get them in one try, like Generations and Forces. Well, yeah, S ranks should be a challenge because that's the whole point. If I S rank Ghost Town in a casual playthrough, then I don't really feel much incentive to come back and master it because there's nowhere higher to go. Well, except maybe for that optional mission where you have to beat it in 60 seconds. But S rank should also be a fun challenge. An Unleashed demands such rote perfection from the player that it might as well be luck based. Think of it like a continuum. If gens and forces are on the easy end and Adventure 2 and Heroes are somewhere over here and the Wii Unleashed is right in the middle, then Unleashed is all the way over here. And no, I'm not joking folks. But EXO, I got all the S ranks easily on my first try when I was two. So therefore you're wrong. Get good, scrub. If only I had a nickel for every time I heard that one. Look, if you enjoy getting all the S ranks in this game, more power to you. In fact, I'm friends with someone who's done it five times and still considers 360 Unleashed to be one of his fagotes. And you know what? He and I can have calm and reasonable conversations about it. I don't take issue with people enjoying this game more than I do. What I don't appreciate is people blaming the player for taking issue with bad design. I'm not criticizing this game for being hard. I'm criticizing it for being designed poorly. But what's so bad about the 7th gen S ranks, you ask? Virtually every S rank in the 7th gen day stages suffer from two interlocking problems. Problem number one is that while the game does tell you what you're graded on, that being clear time, rings collected, QTE tricks, boosting through checkpoints, and defeating enemies, you're not told how many points you need to make the S. This has been a problem since Adventure 2, but in previous games it was usually pretty clear what you needed to do to improve your score. There were also flashy indicators to let the player know what was worth bonus points and what wasn't. Unleashed, on the other hand, is extremely unclear as to how it weighs these different elements, and the priorities seem to actively change from level to level. I spent 20 minutes tightening up my run of Savannah Citadel to perfection, but no matter how much I shaved off the clear time, I still got a big old goose egg. It wasn't until I went out of my way to collect every ring and defeat every enemy that the game finally relented and gave me the S. Thus, the game was communicating to me that clear time was not very important, and that I should focus on killing enemies and collecting rings. Now that I know that, things should get a lot easier, right? Then you get to arid sands and no matter how many enemies you kill or how many rings you collect, Turns out this stage is the complete opposite, and only cares about whether you take all the optional shortcuts to reduce clear time. Which I wouldn't mind if the optimal paths weren't hidden off screen where the player would never find them without a guide. If and only if you manage to take all of these obscure shortcuts in one perfect run will the game give you the yes. The Wii version employs the common sense solution of giving the player score targets to be, complete with an ideal clear time, so that when the player gets an A, they know what they need to improve on in their next run. On top of that, the levels in the Wii version are expertly designed for speedrunning, as I've mentioned before. I do concede that the Wii S ranks are a bit on the easy side, since it is possible to die and still beat the stage in time, and there were certain shortcuts I missed while still getting the S rank. But you're still not going to S rank these stages on your first try, and I actually had fun while doing it. Problem 2 is the score requirements themselves. The S rank clear times in this game are exceptionally strict, so you need to be boosting constantly or you'll never make it in time. On top of that, this game 
really wants you to collect rings, which is more often than not the difference between an A and an S. Unless you were playing a 100 ring mission, Adventure 2 and Heroes didn't really care about how many rings you collected or whether you took damage. It was about whether you could finish the stage quickly without dying. At the very least, these games were smart enough to dole out bonus points as you collected rings. Unleashed, meanwhile, tallies ring bonuses at the end of the stage, and seeing as you lose rings for taking hits, that basically means you're not allowed to get hit at all. And a game with a bad camera that browbeats you into boosting constantly for a fast clear time so that shit can fly on screen faster than you could possibly react and take your rings. And you know what that's like. Yeah, you do. It's just like those terrible half-pipe special stages from Sonic 2. The only way to know where and when rings or ball spikes will appear is to play the stages over and over until you've memorized them. And like Sonic 2, Unleashed's ring bonus requirements are shockingly high for how clunky it is. Sometimes you can afford to take a hit or two, but again, the game doesn't tell you how many rings you need. So as far as you know, you just got knocked down to an A and need to restart. It's easy for experienced players to say, well, avoiding damage isn't that hard. Hell, at this point, even I can do it fairly well in most of the Act 1s because I replayed these stages so many times. But getting to that point was such a frustrating chore. There are also the QTE trick ramps, which reward you with bonus points that are critical for the S. Most of these give you plenty of time, but as the game goes on, and especially in the optional levels, you're only given seconds to input the buttons, and it's just a rank killer. Another nitpick is that restarting a stage takes too many button presses, which is really annoying when you basically have to restart the stage every time you get hit. Unleashed on the Wii also takes too long to restart, but you won't be doing it nearly as often because S ranks are time-based and emphasize finding the best routes, meaning the player can take as many hits as they need to and even die and still make the S rank if they're fast enough. Now, despite everything I just said, I might have excused these issues somewhat if I only had to S-rank the seven main day stages. After all, it's not like SA2 or Heroes didn't have their own share of bad A-ranks. I'm willing to tolerate a few of these per game if a super majority of them are fun challenges. Unfortunately, Sonic Unleashed has a score of terribly designed optional acts to play, and they have S-ranks too. These these optional acts are by far the most frustrating stages in the entire main series. As much as I pick on Sonic 2, that game is way better than this garbage. Once again, just because these levels are optional does not excuse bad design. Now to be fair, while all the optional day stages suck, Dragon Road Act 3 and Skyscraper Scamper Act 2 do have lenient S ranks as I mentioned earlier, and the optional Werehog stages are well designed for the most part and worth playing if you enjoy his gameplay. They're much shorter for one thing, though the limited enemy selection is stretched thin and there's not much new you haven't already seen. In fact, there's a lot of environment and asset reuse going on here, and several of the town missions even recycle parts of Dragon Road and Skyscraper Scamper that were cut from Act 1. The only questionably designed night stage is Dragon Road Act 2. We have to carry gemstones back and forth across tightropes and it's a nightmare to S rank. While some of the optional day stages are totally new, many of them recycle assets from existing stages. In fact, almost all of them involve running laps around a one minute chunk of level design with minor changes. And clearly, they were never play tested. Like they got an intern from Team Meat to design them in five minutes while drinking sake. I know there are some people out there who really like this trial and error kind of design, and even I can enjoy it under certain circumstances when it's done well. But that's the thing, and has to be done well. When the player dies, it needs to feel like their own fault, not the game being poorly made. The DKC games employ flawless control, expertly designed stages that are based on skill rather than rote memorization, a healthy number of checkpoints so you aren't replaying stuff you've already mastered, and are still fast-paced action platformers. The optional acts fall down on the first hurdle because its controls clearly were not optimized for the precision platforming these stages demand of you, especially with that 
half second delay. The biggest problem, however, is that trial and error design just doesn't mesh with the game that incentivizes the player to boost through them as fast as possible. Trial and error design requires precision of movement and the ability to take your time, both of which are hampered when the movement speed is too high. Now, imagine that on top of everything I've just said, that these stages not only have S ranks to get, but that they are just as strict and unforgiving as the main stages. You still have to boost through them as fast as possible, and you're still not allowed to get hit at all. These stages are awful when you're playing them normally, but the S rank experience will make you question why you even play video games to begin with. There is no way these stages were play tested. I refuse to believe that there was any quality assurance here. I could pick apart each stage in painstaking detail, but let's just look at the two worst ones. Savannah Citadel Act 2 is one of the most infamous stages in this game, and if you needed any more proof that the drift is a broken mechanic that simply doesn't work, this is it. Just look at the footage I'm putting in front of you. You'd think that the S rank requirements would be lenient to compensate, but no! You still have to be perfect and can't make any mistakes. The worst part is that despite the game making it look like you're supposed to boost and drift, you can easily cheese it by running at normal speed and manually turning the camera while running corners. If you do that, you will get the S rank on your first try. What a joke. Dragon Road Act 2. God, I hate this level. Unleashed's terrible platforming controls, poor camera, and clunky stage pacing are on full display here, with Sonic slamming into hazards faster than the player can conceivably react to them, and the stage itself going on for three tedious laps. Once again, the S rank requirements are too strict for their own good, as Sonic is essentially not allowed to get hit even once in a stage that constantly surprises you with off-screen hazards. I could go on, but but I think you get the point. Uh, however, we're not done yet. We still got a S rank Eggman land. Oh, but EXO, before you go, you should remember this game has DLC. All oh, right, Sonic Unleashed has DLC. While Generations got nothing but a lame pinball table, Unleashed got seven packs of DLC stages that effectively double this game's stage count. For review's sake, I shelled out the $20 to play them for this video. Does the DLC redeem the mistake? of the on-disc optional acts and provide a worthwhile experience for your money? Oh, for fuck's sake. They just couldn't throw me a bone, could they? As before, the night stages are overall pretty good, though I did have a rough time s ranking Arid Sands Act 3, and the Mook Rush and Windmill Isle Act 1-3 overstayed its welcome. Despite all the asset reuse, there were some clever platforming sections and even some day stages that were surprisingly decent. The majority of the day DLC, however, seems to go out of its way to exacerbate everything that made the on-disc optional acts so terrible. In fact, Windmill Isle Act 4 is the poster child for everything I hate about this game. Despite only being a minute long, this level took me an hour and a half to S rank because of the mandatory boosting, surprise hazards you'll never see in time, abysmal 3D platforming control, arbitrary enemy placements, the stupid light speed dash only working when it feels like it, and a required QTE ramp that gives you just barely enough time to enter the button sequence etc, etc. Naturally, because of all that, you'd want to take the stage slow and steady, but the S rank requires you to clear the stage in roughly one minute without getting hit even once. Trust me when I say that S ranking this and any other day stage looks way easier than it actually is. It's one thing to watch footage on the internet, it's another thing to be sitting in your chair, controller in your sweaty hands trying to S rank this rubbish. Roughly half of the DLC stages are just more frustrating versions of levels you've already played. How would you like to play Arid Sands Act 1 again? Except with a bunch of fucking spikes and fire everywhere that no goddamn good player will ever see coming in time. In fact, that pretty much describes all the Act 1-2s. It's the same level, except plastered with walls of pace-breaking spikes that make you want to throw the game out the goddamn window. Evidently, the DLC designers weren't content just 
just to ruin the main stages, seeing as they seem to go out of their way to find the worst optional acts and make them even worse. Remember Savannah Citadel Act 2? Believe me when I say that Cool Edge Act 3 is the real deal. This level is way longer, requires you to run across extremely narrow platforms at full speed, and once again emphasizes the drifting mechanic that doesn't even work. Unlike the other stage, you can't cheese the S rank by turning the camera. You have to keep boosting and you have to keep drifting. Again, you'd hope the designers would be lenient, but alas, the S rank expects perfection. Other DLC stages find completely new ways to enrage the player. Savannah Citadel Act 3 was a relatively inoffensive optional act where you ran laps around a tree and collected rings, and eventually the goal ring appeared. In Savannah Citadel Act 3-2, the goal ring is just missing. Seriously, where the hell is it? Oh, it's hidden off screen and only accessible from a very specific spring. So that means to S rank this stage, you have to bumble around collecting rings without getting hit, find this hidden spring that looks like all the others, and reach the goal ring in less than one minute. Does that sound like fun to you? Arid Sands Act 3 is the only fully free roaming day stage in Sonic Unleashed. And guess what? It sucks. I've already gone over how the 3D movement and platforming in this game leaves a lot to be desired, and that's the biggest problem here. To top it all off, this level is a giant maze where you're expected to lumber around looking for 10 chow. Just figuring out where to go is frustrating enough, but the fact that you have to memorize 10 chow locations and do it quickly for the S rank just kills it. Remember Dragon Road Act 2? The DLC has a Dragon Road 2-2, and it is the absolute nadir of Sonic Unleashed. This level goes on for five tedious laps and throws everything in the kitchen sink at you. But surely the designers would be late. Of course not. I'm not gonna lie, folks. S-ranking the stage broke me. It took me two hours. And this was after I had already wasted two hours S-ranking Dragon Road Act 1-2. Both of these levels think spamming missile robots and plastering spikes all over the place is the greatest idea for a level ever. I went insane. I cursed up a storm. I screamed at the TV. And only after two hours of utter torture did the game finally cave and give me the S rank. The Chun-An DLC was so bad that I almost threw in the towel on S ranks altogether because enough was simply enough. And you might wonder why I had even kept going for so long when I really wasn't enjoying myself. Well, it's like the great James Rolfe once said, because you're angry and you wanna win. After everything I had gone through, I didn't want to give the game the satisfaction of my giving up. I had simply put in too much work to turn back now. So, after putting the game down for 24 hours, I moved on to the Empire City DLC. Thankfully, after Chun-An, the quality of the DLC improves with each pack. The Adabat DLC is relatively well made and not a time sink to S rank, and even Act 1-2 is actually easier than the original, almost like an apology for all the frustration you've endured up to this point. So, needless to say, don't waste your money on the DLC. Not unless you really like the Werehog and only want to play those stages. The Wii Unleashed also has its fair share of optional missions to play, such as collecting rings within a time limit, completing time trials, avoiding breakables, etc. It's very reminiscent of the optional missions from the adventure games, though the execution reminds me more of Secret Rings. For some reason, these late aughts Sonic games thought that putting what used to be optional missions in the main game was a fantastic idea and that everyone would love it. The storybook games and nutshell. Unfortunately, Unleashed Wii does the same thing, but not to the same extent. For the most part, the required missions are fairly straightforward and don't waste the player's time. While most of the optional missions recycle existing stage geometry, a handful like the Spagonia Time Trial, the Chunan Time Trial, and the Shamar Ring mission actually have brand new stages to play, which suggests to me that they were originally going to be three or five acts per country like the Night Half, but they ran out of time and repurposed them for optional missions. Speaking of 
which, there's no Savannah Citadel or Skyscraper Scamper in this game, which I always forget about. Personally, I don't have a problem with that and feel like this game has plenty of content as is. While I would have preferred just having optional stages without missions, for the most part I really enjoyed them regardless. Unlike the garbage optional acts from the 7th gen games, these stages are actually well designed and fun to play, and don't demand more of the player than what is reasonable with the controls or camera. Moreover, these missions aren't ranked, so they actually play a lot more like the 7th gen town missions. I would have been fine with ranks in these stages honestly, but it also meant that I could enjoy the missions more for what they were, so yeah. Alright, with that out of the way, it's time to talk about Eggman Land. You have to understand folks, as someone who played Sonic Adventure so many times as a kid, the idea of a playable Robotnik land was an exciting proposition. Little could I imagine that this would be the worst final stage in a main series Sonic game. And for once, I seem to be with the majority. You've all heard this before, so I'll keep this brief. This level is just way, way too long and has too many bullshit death traps. It's so bad that this is where I gave up on Unleashed my first playthrough in 2008. I know it's the final level and that it's supposed to be hard, but what reason was there to cram what is essentially two levels into one 30 minute endurance test? Why couldn't Sonic Team have split this up into a day and night stage? Or God forbid, several shorter stages. Even in this two hour long review, I split it into two halves and gave you timestamps so you could come back to it later. What's Sonic Team's excuse? So they could have hot dog missions? Those things 1% of the audience played? In fact, the Wii version does split this stage into six acts. And while Five Night stages was excessive, I had a lot more fun playing Eggman Land on the Wii than I've ever had in the seventh gen version. The idea of switching between Sonic and the Werehog in the same level is a fascinating one. And again, the Wii Guy Gates actually put that idea to good use in small confined puzzle rooms. The problem is that Sonic and Werehog level design are so diametrically opposed that in a longer stage it works about as well as a beef chocolate sandwich. Especially from an S rank standpoint, it's really frustrating to slowly inch across pipes and meticulously nail QTE finishers for points only to die from some dumb bullshit the moment you switch to Sonic. Yes, Cannon's core had you switch between five characters in one stage, but their score was tallied individually and then added up at the end. So if you died as Knuckles, your points from the previous characters didn't erase. Apparently, it is possible to S rank Eggman Land from the last checkpoint, but the best I could ever do from here was an A. I always consistently died after that last checkpoint and reset my score to zero. I spent four hours trying to beat the stage without dying for S rank's sake, or at least trying to survive from before the last checkpoint, and it was pure misery. It took me four hours to get that. Four hours. Next up is a final fight with the Egg Dragoon, which is surprisingly the easiest boss in both games. All you do is punch him in the chest a few times, do a QTE to finish him off, and that's just all she wrote. After this, Sonic has to fight a big dumb monster, because we did that in all the other games. And it is bar none the worst final boss in any Sonic game I've ever played. The time eater is up there, don't get me wrong. And I may not have liked the Death Egg Robot the first time I played it, but at least that was quick when you know what you're doing. The problem with Dark Gaia is that it's just so boring and goes on for at least 10 agonizing minutes. Starting with the Gaia Colossus, the design is cool, but the actual gameplay is soul crushingly dull. How would you like to lethargically charge at Dark Gaia for three straight minutes while barely being able to move out of the way of obstacles? You can punch the meteors, but the punch is so delayed that it's luck if you time them correctly. Once you do reach Dark Gaia, all you do is a bunch of boring, slow QTEs. How exciting. Each time you finish a Colossus section, you'll switch to Sonic, and need to race to the end within a very strict time limit. Much like 06's End of the World, the game keeps throwing pace-breaking hazards at you from off-screen before you have time to react, making it likely you'll run out of time. After seven minutes of boring frustration, Sonic finishes off Dark Gaia's third eye. Instead of the boss dying, it moves on to a second phase because Sonic Adventure did that. Dark 
Gaia becomes even more hideous and out of place in a Sonic game, and Sonic goes supersonic, which he really should have just done to begin with. The final phase begins, and is reminiscent of Doomsday Zone from Sonic 3 Knuckles. When you reach Dark Gaia, all you really do is wander around and kill snakes. And you have to be quick or Dark Gaia will destroy the Colossus before you can back him up. After that, the game throttles you with a flurry of quick time events, including a part where you have to press X or square 60 times. After all that, Dark Gaia finally, finally dies. And you receive a Wait, no ranks? Sweet! Oh, you've gotta be joking. Get this, you have to replay the boss, which nobody will ever do, in order to receive a rank. Even then, surely the S rank. Do you even have to ask? This S rank is just as cruel and unusual as all the others. The Sonic sections are easy to memorize and clear without dying, but the only real way to avoid the meteors in the Colossus sections is to write down the order they appear on a piece of paper. And if you die, then six tedious minutes of gameplay just went down the drain. And again, and there's no restart option. You have to leave the stage and come back. Why? You'd think that just beating the boss without dying would be enough, but no! Once again, you need to collect a whole bunch of rings, but that's not enough either. The game also expects you to punch as many meteors as possible, even though there's no indication whatsoever that this adds to your score. It only took me an hour, but finally the game relented and gave me the S rank. Like everything else in this game, Dark Guy seems easy and not that bad if you're practiced, to the point I actually finished my PS3 run of this boss in my first try without dying, but your first playthrough is an absolute nightmare. The Wii version of Dark Gaia is still one of the worst final bosses in the series, but it is still much better than the 360 PS3 version. Instead of a boring slog where you dodge meteors, the Colossus segment is a punch-out Wii-esque boxing match where you dodge attacks and strike when his guard is dead. Down. It's actually a lot of fun, and I wouldn't have minded if the entire boss was like this. The same Sonic level design from the 7th gen version returns here with minor changes, the biggest being that there's no time limit and you don't go back to more Colossus in between. The second half with Super Sonic is unfortunately a big pain in the butt if you don't know what to do, and you aren't really given enough time to figure it out before you run out of rings and die. That's why I highly recommend upgrading your lives counter in the Gaia Gate before taking him on. I didn't know about these upgrades and got a whole bunch of game overs on this half of the boss, so the game really should have mentioned that that was an option. Once you figure out how to fight him, this boss isn't too bad. And unlike the other version, not only is the S rank somewhat lenient, but you're actually given a rank on your first go around. Alright, so after sinking 40 hours into the 7th gen S ranks and suffering my way through the optional acts and terrible DLC stages, I finally finally got all the S ranks in the game. The previous games gave you a Metal Sonic skin, Green Hill Zone, and a Super Hard mode for collecting all the emblems and A ranks. None of these rewards were super amazing, but it was something to prove to your friends that you really put in all the work to unlock them. Even Sonic 06 gave you achievements for getting all the S ranks. So what do you unlock in the 7th Gen Sonic Unleashed? Nothing. Nothing at all. Not even joking. No new stages, no achievements, not even a postcard. <sighs> All right, cue the music. In my Sunshine review, I defended blue coins because I found the act of collecting them satisfying in itself, to the point where I didn't really care about the lacking reward because I was having so much fun along the way. In the case of Unleashed, the S ranks were frustrating time sinks, so the fact that you get nothing, not even so much as a congratulations, is absolutely inexcusable. Even the Korok seeds, which unlock a literal golden turd, give you more acknowledgement than this. There isn't even an S rank tally on the world map or anything, so the only way I can prove to you guys that I really did it all is to show you a bunch of sped up footage of the stage lists. The 
Wii version, meanwhile, was not only a lot more fun to S-rank, but doing so rewards you with medals you can use to open optional areas of the Gaia Gate, where you can upgrade your lives counter for the tougher later stages, as well as other collectibles and optional missions. Your reward for collecting all the medals and all the art books and stuff is the game's final mission. The game doesn't really tell you that the art books are mandatory to unlock missions, which admittedly annoyed me. The game also has a convenient status screen to see what S-ranks you're missing, as well as in-game hints as to where missing collectibles might be. I had fun 100%ing this game, and I'd do it again! Whereas the S-rank experience in the 7th gen version made me want to stop playing video games forever. Save yourselves the frustration. Just play this game casually and skip all the optional day levels. A lot of people will say that's what I should have done to begin with, but I enjoyed 100%ing Adventure 2 and Heroes. Not to mention we Unleashed, so the fact that the 7th gen Unleashed is such an exercise and frustration to fully complete makes it a lesser game in my eyes. In fact, let's just get this out of the way. This game has way too much content for something developed in only two years. Sonic 06 was a game that was patently unfinished in every respect. Despite a limited production schedule, the designers wasted their time designing 18 playable characters, 50 terrible town missions, 10 medals in every stage, a hard version of each campaign stage, and a multiplayer mode nobody played. Unleashed thankfully dialed the game modes back to just Sonic, the Werehog, and the Tornado. So they learned something. Nevertheless, while it is definitely much more finished than 06, Sonic Unleashed was clearly rushed out the door and the end product suffered significantly. Before I get into this, I want to make it clear that I wasn't there. I didn't experience the development process for this game personally, and I really can't say for certain that 7 Gen Unleashed would have turned out better if Sonic Team had cut back on the side content. But, seeing as the Hedgehog engine alone supposedly took one of the two years to finish, I gotta imagine committing to so much extra stuff really didn't help their situation. In the span of two years, Sonic Team coded a brand new engine from scratch, modeled, textured, and rigged a bunch of models and environments, and designed and playtested three new game modes. Moreover, the designers placed 400 medals, 71 art books, 62 records, 59 videotapes, and 45 souvenirs across the game's 44 playable acts, 8 hubs, and 44 town missions, and also designed and playtested 141 hot dog missions. That's right, I've barely even mentioned Don Faccio. These are like the Wii missions in that they're unranked challenges where you collect rings, race to the end, and defeat enemies as Sonic, or race to the end or beat the stage without healing items as the Werehog. I don't have a problem with the mission concepts, but what I don't understand is why there had to be three difficulties for each mission. Instead of just having the hardest mission, or using the difficulty as thresholds for a ranking system, Unleashed forces you to replay the exact same missions three times each. That means that assuming you S-rank every stage on your first try, you're looking at a minimum of ten playthroughs of every day stage, and seven playthroughs of every night stage to 100% this game. Ugh. I mean, seriously, Sonic Team, do you think that was enough? The missions also reset if you die, which is fine for most levels, but a real pisser for Eggman Land. As repetitive as some of the optional missions in the previous games could be, each one of them had a different goal. The game didn't make you play the 100 ring missions three times. More importantly, the mission ended once you fulfilled the objective and didn't waste your time making you reach the goal ring afterwards. I got all four 400 medals and all 77 S ranks, but the idea of playing the same exact missions over and over and over again is where I draw the line personally. No amount of bragging rights is worth that. But EXO, if you hate the optional content so much, just don't play it. Well, you're right, but remember what I said. Once you become a completionist, it rewires your brain and makes it difficult to just play casually. I can't help myself. More importantly, Sonic Team had to spend a development time putting these things in the game. And when you have to keep track of so many little details in a strict two-year development cycle, things will naturally slip through the cracks. How can you take the time to polish the controls or improve the performance when you've committed to programming 637 collectibles? The worst part is that you could take out the hot dog missions, or the medals, or the town missions, or even the optional acts, and nobody would have said, Yeah, this game is great. But I really wish there was an optional mission I could play where I ran around and collected oranges. Mmm. 
Oranges. Zero out of ten. The fact that people are so surprised I bothered with S ranks of the optional acts shows that nobody wanted to play these things. So why spend precious development time playtesting them? Well, evidently, they didn't even have time to do that. Then, when the developers had finally released the game, instead of taking time to look at issues people were having in patching the resolution, or the frame rate, or the controls, instead they designed 43 DLC stages, half of which just recycle existing levels, and made no attempt to improve upon what needed to be fixed. Say what you will about Lost World having to patch extra lives upon 100 rings into the game, but that's more than the Unleashed devs ever did. Ugh, but I digress. With all that said, we finally reached the conclusion. Christ, that was a long one. I really should have started cross-platform with something easy, like Glubber, but I had no idea going into this review just how much there would be to discuss. So, cross-platform. Which versions would I recommend, if any? I think it's important to note that between the Wii and 7th gen versions, it feels like there's a better version of Sonic Unleashed we never got. Imagine a game that had the 360 hubs and the Wii Guy Gates, the Wii Day stages and controls, the 360 Night stages and combat, the first half of the Wii Dark Gaia, and the second half of the 360 fight. If I could play that version of Sonic Unleashed, I would understand why so many people consider it their favorite Sonic game. But, alas, this was my first time playing the Wii version, and despite some quibbles, I was surprised at how much I legitimately enjoyed this game. The level design is solid, the controls are an improvement on the 7th gen version, the camera is more helpful and dynamic, S ranks out for a fun challenge that doesn't overstay its welcome while unlocking extra content, the graphics are above average for Wii with some colorful textures and nice models, and I had a lot of fun playing the optional missions. The Werehog in this game with its motion mash combat is a step down from the 360 PS3, but I still had fun with them for what they were and I appreciated not having to spam QTE finishers. That said, there are a few things I didn't like, chiefly the smartphone looking hub worlds that only exist to pad out game time, Dark Gaia, or the motion mash QTEs that only exist because we. Moreover, the lack of Missouri and Empire City stages is puzzling. Additionally, the PS2 version has shockingly bad graphics for 2008, performance drops, dithering, and frequent load times. Despite all of that, I still had a lot of fun playing it, which speaks to the strength of the underlying game design. It's like they always say, better graphics don't always make a better game. I still would overwhelmingly recommend the Wii version with the classic controller over the PS2 version, but yeah. I can understand why someone who really liked the 7th gen hub worlds or the breakneck pace of those day stages might not enjoy this game as much. But to me personally, the Wii version of Sonic Unleashed is simply better designed and more fun to 100%. And so, I nominate it for cross-platform MVP. Despite all my bitching, I don't hate the 360 PS3 version on the whole. I'm just thoroughly split on it. While the Werehog stages have no business being in a Sonic game, they nevertheless offer legitimately fun and well-designed Spectacle Fighter gameplay. The combos are great, the stages themselves are fun to speedrun, and even the bosses are pretty solid. The graphics technically are behind the times in terms of resolution and frame rate, and the models and environments are kind of 50-50 between impressive and dated. Still, the game makes up for this somewhat with solid art direction that sells the feeling of a world adventure with the cartoony aesthetic. The production value and the storytelling is a huge step forward for the series, and I was surprised at how much I enjoyed the hub worlds once I went out of my way to interact with the characters. Despite all of these things, however, the 360 PS3 version was clearly rushed out the door and the end product suffered for it. The handling is slippery in 3D and the platforming is awkward and delayed, the camera is zoomed in so close that you can't see what's coming in time, and the level design doesn't work well around these limitations. While the main acts are relatively harmless on a casual playthrough and can even be fun when you've memorized them, the optional acts and DLC stages are so bad that I never want to play them again as long as I live. Moreover, the S ranks are so cruel and unforgiving that there's no way that they were play tested. On top of that, Sonic Team wasted precious development time designing things nobody was asking for, like town missions, hot dog missions, sun and moon medals, and 237 other collectibles. While it's true that the casual experience of Unleashed is much better than the completionist one, Eggman Land is still a horrendous final stage that goes on way too long, while Dark Gaia is a boring, frustrating slog that just made me want to shut the game off. Unleashed's ending is so draining and leaves such a terrible lasting impression that these things alone make this one of my least favorite main series Sonic games, even barring the S ranks or the DLC. Like I said, I don't have 
have a problem with other people liking this game more than I do. I'm just arguing that there are plenty of legitimate reasons to dislike this game, just as there are for Sonic 2, or Sonic Heroes, or even Sonic Adventure 2 for as much as I love that game. All of these games have their problems, but in my opinion, Sonic Unleashed is the messiest of them all. Despite all my criticisms, I do think both the 360 and PS3 versions are worth checking out if you've never played them before. It's entirely possible that you could play them and enjoy them more than me. And like I said, there are plenty of things to like about this game. No, the Razzie goes to the mobile version for being so bad that it barely even counts as a game. And while the PS2 version is still a competent game underneath the graphics and load times, the Wii version is so much better in every way that it doesn't matter. So yeah, check those games out if you haven't already and form your own opinions. Anyways, that was Sonic Unleashed and I need to work on something a little shorter next time. If you liked today's review, make sure to give it a like and consider subscribing for more. You can also find me on the Unverse cast where I meet up with Hadox, Ryrule, and King K to talk about video games and read bad fan fiction. You can find video versions of the podcast on YouTube and an audio version on SoundCloud and iTunes. I also have a Let's Play channel, EPG Plays, where I offer informative playthroughs on games I like and some I don't. It's also the new home of Zebro's Play, sillier playthroughs I do with my brother. Be sure to go check those out. Until next time, I'm Exaparadigm Gamer, and I hope you enjoyed the review. Memories you can recall with me any time of day. You can reach out, you can ask me in your soul. I will answer. Oh